an audience that loves the Lord and wants to honor God and honor country. What do you have to say, two parts, the first part of the question I'll ask, to Christians who say, I think God is done with this country. I think that our, wor our worst days are ahead. How would you respond to that? I would respond to that by saying, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> Here in Michigan, our data analysis of Turning Point Action shows us that there are hundreds of thousands and close to maybe even 500 to 750,000 Christians that don't vote and or they passively vote. Even worse than that, there are Christians that say, I don't know if I can vote for Donald Trump. How would you respond to both of those Christians who don't vote or Christians that are uneasy about Donald Trump? I would say the reason that we have the freedom that we have now and the ability to live in peace is because there were people before us who were willing to stand up for what they believed in. Many of them, not just to vote, they gave their lives so that we could have freedom and peace in our country. And I would ask them the question, what are you willing to do for your children? Because what we do today will have a dramatic impact on the kind of life that they will have. The debts that they have to pay, the people that they have to deal with, the principles that they will value or not value, depending on how we present them. we got to remember, this is the United States of America. This is America. We have the can-do spirit, not the what-can-you-do-for-me spirit. That's what made us into a great nation. But we have to play our part. There are so many different forces at play here in this election. We need to have the grassroots turn out in record numbers and do the work. Register new voters. Find low-propensity voters. You might say, what is a low-propensity voter? A low propensity voter is your Uncle Frank, who complains all the time that grocery prices are too high, that crime is going up, that the country is not what it used to be, but he doesn't vote. That is a low propensity voter. Raise your hand if you know somebody like that in your life. Every person raising your hand, you gotta go find that Uncle Frank, register him to vote, and tell him it is their duty to go vote for Donald Trump, or I never wanna hear your complaining ever again. Dr. Carson, how do we best identify, register, find those low propensity voters? This election will be determined by whether or not we are able to translate the, the concern that the everyday American has for the direction of the country into ballots and votes. All we have to do is get people to open their eyes and look and see what's going on. Just like with Benjamin Harrison, and Grover Cleveland, it's the same situation. We're fortunate in the sense that we've had these two administrations juxtaposed right next to each other. You don't have to remember back 20 years or 30 years ago. You just have to remember three or four years ago to see what was going on and what's going on now. And we're going to continue down this downward spiral unless we change it. And like I said, our founders gave us the ability to change it but we have to take advantage of that. That is really the key right now. It is all in our hands. We have to talk about it. Don't shy away from those conversations at the dinner table and in your neighborhoods. Go out there and proclaim the gospel of freedom in this country. Dr. Carson, I want to close with this. We at Turning Point USA, our educational arm, we've been partnering with you in American Cornerstone of bringing Dr. Carson to college campuses across the country. He has been selling out auditoriums, by the way, and doing a great job. What have you witnessed 
seen or maybe even learned from these college campus visits that might be helpful for our audience to hear? Well, I have been thrilled to see those young people because they recognize that the pathway that we're on right now will preclude them realizing the American dream. They realize that we need to make a course correction. They are willing to do that. We all need to get behind them. We're talking about their future. You know, there are some older people here like myself. You know, we've realized the American dream. Everything has worked well for us. And we're going to sail into the night and nothing's going to happen. But 20 or 30 years from now, the things that we're putting in place right now will have a dramatic impact. I think a lot of those college kids understand that. And that's why they are moving. They're not listening to the lies anymore. You can only listen to lies for so long. And you know, one of the things that happens before countries change into a Marxist regimen is they dumb down the population. Have you noticed that? And when Alexis Tocqueville came here in 1831 to study our nation, he was blown away by the fact that he could find a mountain man in the middle of the forest and a guy could read. The guy to tell him about the, the, the Declaration of Independence. What do we have now? You see those men on the street interviews and they ask them, you know, who won the Revolutionary War? They don't even know what you're talking about. They don't know who, who won any war. They don't know who, what countries are next to our country. They don't know anything. I mean, it must hurt to be so stupid. But the fact of the matter is, you have to dumb down the population first in order to get people who already have a wonderful situation to accept something worse than what they have. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to dumb you down, trying to make you think that what we have is nasty, is no good, and that you want something else. We don't want Marxism. We don't want the government taking care of us from cradle to grave. This is America. We want to take care of ourselves, and we want to do it with our own principles.